Welcome to the Databricks Skill Builder Series. We're glad you're here. More kids run in and out. Um, uh, it, summer's already begun on our on my side, and they're not used to dad jumping into to meetings all the time. So I, I gave him a, a heads up about five minutes ago, but I guess it, he might still run in and out. Um, but in the, anyways, um, lieu of that. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm a solutions architect here at Databricks. Uh, I've been working here for about a year. Um, I, I work with customers to make sure that they're successful using uh, the technology. Uh, a lot of it has been centered around Delta Live Tables. Um, came out probably a little bit after I, I started here officially. GA, it had been in preview before that. Um, I'm going to share my screen here and we'll go ahead and get started. First, I just want to answer the question you know, what? What are our Delta Life tables? Uh, for anyone who may not be completely aware, my, my guess is many of you who are here are here uh, to learn specifically about them. So you already have a little bit of a history, but we'll just catch anybody up who, who doesn't know it. So the question that starts is what's the problem with data engineering? Um, you know, we know that data is vital to business. Um, and I think most business leaders understand the importance of data to their operation. Um, the, the question that a lot of them have is whether or not they can effectively use their data uh, and, and curate it through pipelines and stuff to be able to get the right reports, the right insights that they want. Um, and that's where data delivery comes in. There's a lot of complexity in it, especially if a, a company has a lot of legacy um, and very few resources uh, to to rework that legacy, um, there's a lot of technical debt that has been built into their platforms over time, um, introducing a lot of various different technologies for different solutions, um, maybe different groups doing their own thing, maybe some shadow IT somewhere. Um, but in the end, you have a lot of complexity around your, your data moving in and out. And oftentimes if somebody asks, you know, where did this number come from on a report? Um, it can be very difficult to get that answer. Um, and especially if someone feels like something might be incorrect uh, to better understand where that came from, um, why it's the number that it is. And then if something needs to change, um, you know, finding the right person to make that change, uh, especially if it was built in a, a very um, proprietary manner. Uh, so how does Databricks help? Um, so, uh, you know, Databricks Lakehouse, it's a, it's a great platform for data engineering. Um, you know, it's, it's a very open platform that can work with a lot of technologies based on your needs. Uh, at the same time, we put forward our own technologies as, as best practices to try to solve a lot of these issues as they come up. So Delta Live Table, um, the best way to do ETL on the Lakehouse. So it's, a, it's based on streaming architecture. Um, the idea is, you know, if you've ever used autoloader in the past to be able to ingest files um, or created streams off of Kafka or anything to, to bring in data, um, it's, it's that same type of uh, concept, except much simpler. So a lot of the pipelines and things that you have to build, uh, a lot of the plumbing, as I like to refer to it, it's just built out for you automatically under the covers. Um, all you have to do is declare the logic. So for instance, here using SQL syntax, you can create a table using very similar CTAD, create table as um, nomenclature. Uh, and in the background, it builds out the entire pipeline to be able to do incremental streaming um, processes to be able to load your data into a table. Uh, so the, the one difference here becomes create streaming table um, or create live table. So the streaming table is streaming files using autoloader from this, this uh, source. And then this live table is reading that, that stream as it comes in and it's building a table definition called clean data on top of that. Um, using that live schema, it, it communicates to DLT to use a, a table that's already being built by DLT, which is that raw data there. So um, we're gonna go ahead and, and learn a little bit more about what this is. 
So the concept here is that we can use this technology to build production level ETL pipelines um, with DLT. And the, uh, you, know, you can use auto loader in the background with that ingest cloud files process, bring in your bronze table. You can do real easy ETL either through Python or SQL. Um, depending on what your people are, are most comfortable with. So if they're already used to writing SQL and they can build a table in that SQL, um, how they want it to look in silver, they can just perform that there. At the same time, they're able to do data quality checks. Um, so they're able to declare expectations. So whether or not a field is null or not, um, you know, it shouldn't be blanket, it's required. Um, and you can also declare what you want it to do with those exceptions at the time that it, that it runs. So you can either um, drop the files or you can, um, er, sorry, drop the records. You can just alert that the error occurred or you can actually stop the entire pipeline. So on fail. So one is almost like a warning, hey, uh, record that something happened, but let it flow through. The other one is, uh, this is more of an error, but I don't wanna block, block the whole pipeline, just this record. So that record gets dropped and the, it continues to process. And the other is, hey, this is a, a failure, um, fail the whole pipeline. And so the whole pipeline will, will go down. Uh, I say go down, but it'll, it'll error. And so you won't process any more records until you remediate that data. Um, and then, so you'd build out your silver layer like that. And then once again, you can do the exact same type of logic, um, get it here into your gold zone. And once again, use it for everything that you would normally use your analytics platform for, BI, whatnot. Um, so the, the key differentiators, one, continuous or scheduled data ingestion. It's the exact same code, no matter what you're doing. If you're wanting to run this in batch uh, every hour, every night, every week, or if you want to run it continuously. Um, the configuration changes are performed at the pipeline level, not at the code level. So you write code. Uh, to, to ingest the data, and then you um, configure the pipeline based on how frequently you want to run it. Um, it. It works with all these different files as sources if you're ingesting files, um, automatic schema evolution, and then rescue data. Um, so if, if a record comes in that's unexpected, has a different schema than expected, it doesn't fail, it doesn't drop that data, it just Kind of moves it into a rescue data column. Um, and then once again, you can set up like data quality checks to filter those records out so that they don't come in and cause any issues for you. Um, so declarative SQL and Python. So this is very similar to the type of declaration that you would make, create streaming view. Um, a view is like a temporary table. It's not actually persisted. It's not creating a view in the background. And so this is basically saying, hey, I want to I want to import and load it into memory, these cloud files that are out there. Um, create streaming table, that's where it actually persists it out. So it persists it out in account, account bronze, uh, selecting from this, this temporary table that we've, we've created in our memory. Um, and then to create streaming table account silver, and you know, declaring a certain comment with it, select star from account bronze. You know, the idea is you, you apply your transformation logic and stuff there to, to build out your silver layer. Um, so it's, it's very simple syntax. If you've ever built out a prototype for a report, you've probably used this exact same workflow where you just create tables to persist out your, your uh, logic so that you know, you're not waiting forever for um, a query to run every time and then you finally get your result and then you go back and you rebuild your entire pipeline well here all you have to do is start adding these little nomenclatures like oops, like streaming um and things like that and and you're done uh cdc you know this isn't just insert only so this can handle cdc uh it's it's a very simple declaration so you use the syntax apply changes into, and it loads the, the tables into there. And it has certain few fields that you can set to specify um, the, what the, you know, what the, 
what column to be checking for, uh, for like uh, the, your primary key. So what's, what's that primary key that you wanna use to drive your, your merges? And then also what's your sequence? So whether or not it's a date or a version number or something like that, you can specify what column you wanna use for that. And um, it, it just handles all the merge logic for you automatically, whether or not it's an insert or an update. And then you can specify where deletes would come in if you wanna do hard deletes instead of soft deletes. Um, yeah, so it also supports SCD2. It's very simple to, to set up an SCD2 if you're uh, used to working with slowly changing dimensions at all. Uh, all you gotta do is specify type two, SCD type two, and in the apply changes into syntax and it starts it builds out all the logic for you to do SVD type two in the background so if you've ever worked with that that uh, becomes a huge value add because there's usually lots of logic and things that you got to implement and an etl object to be able to facilitate that uh, data quality and monitoring so as we talked about it you can create expectations so this is a constraint, uh, naming that constraint. This is the expectation right here that account date is not null and account close date is greater than the account open date. So just things that would make sense, you know, the account, account date's not null um, and that it wasn't closed before it was opened. And if it violates that, drop the row. So as I said, there's three different things. You can fail the whole pipeline. You can drop the record, you can alert, um, there's also a design pattern around quarantining. So you can move uh, records to a quarantine table as, uh, as opposed to just dropping them. Um, and so there's, there's a design pattern for that. Um, all data pipeline runs and uh, data quality is, is captured. Um, everything's written out to an event log and that event log is real simple to ingest and build um, data quality reports on top of. And that's something else that we'll look at. All right, so observability, uh, when you build your pipeline and run it, it creates an entire DAG, a picture, so you see the data flowing. It's real easy to click on individual objects and see uh, what's their failure rate, how, how much data has flowed through, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so then uh, you can make adjustments. You can refresh individual tables. You can do a full refresh across the whole thing or, or just do a run, uh, real easy to manage all that. And then when you're done developing, you just move it over to production and set up your schedule or set it up to run continuously and you're good to go. Uh, it works within workflows. So you can set it up as like a task to run inside workflows. So you can synchronize it with either other DLT pipelines or um, other jobs that you have. Uh, automated ETL development lifecycle. So because of the way that it's structured, you don't have to change anything in the code. Everything is configured through the pipeline. So the pipeline has all the settings that are necessary to control where data is written to. Um, it has a lot of variables and stuff that you can put into the configuration of it. So it makes it real easy to move it from development stage and production. Everything can be managed through APIs. So it's really easy to extract that pipeline through the API, um, have some environment variables or make some configuration cha changes and bring it right back in into a staging um, environment or a production environment uh, it, with just those little configuration changes um, facilitated by CICD so that uh, you're, not, you're not touching the code at all. It's just the settings around uh, the pipeline itself. Right. Um, I'm probably not going to go through every single slide that I have here. It's a pretty big slide deck. So enhanced auto scaling. Uh, one of the benefits of DLT is that it manages its workloads very efficiently. Um, and so it, it, it only uses the clusters that you need um, and uses them very well. And so um, there's, there's a whole blog out there around ingesting um, a billion records for under a dollar or something. And uh, they they show the nodes that uh, in a typical ETL pipeline, 
uh, the nodes are, uh, are busy, but not extremely busy. But with a DLT pipeline, the driver is like a, a yellow green thing. It's not very busy, but all the workers are, are hard red um, because they're, they're very busy. And so the driver is very efficiently working all of its workers and, and this enhanced auto scaling is, is part of that. So it's scaled up based on what it can uh, efficiently do with the workload to keep, make sure you're not getting behind, but you're also not um, spending dollars you don't need to spend. Okay, all right, I already talked about workflows. So I'm gonna go ahead and exit out of here and we'll, uh, we'll start looking at the demo itself. So one thing that I really wanna showcase here is DB demos. Um, this is a great resource. If you go to dbdemo.ai, um, it's a great resource for finding all sorts of demos around um, not just DLT, but all sorts of Databricks features. So today, what we're gonna be working with is, is this DB demos. Um, you just do a pip install, DB demos, it'll install it. I'm importing it. And then what I'm doing is I'm installing DLT loans. There is actually a few different uh, demos that are out there that make it real easy to bring them in. But this way you can work with the code yourself and you can replicate exactly what we're doing. Uh, one of the great things with this process is it doesn't just bring in notebooks. It installs dashboards, um, it sets up jobs, um, and it sets up the actual pipeline as well. So it makes it much easier than just importing in your notebooks, creating your own pipeline, building dashboards and, and running your jobs and things like that. Um, it even creates a, a cluster for you. Uh, we're, we're not gonna be using that today, but you know, it does all this work for you just by simply running um, install DLT loans. So very much recommend using that site uh, for when you're wanting to learn a new Databricks concept, keeps you from building out a lot of the, the structure that you need, uh, allows you to learn very quickly. So the first thing we're gonna do um, is I'm gonna, oops, wanted to pop into our pipeline that was created. So um, this Delta Live Tables pipeline. So as you see, uh, when it was run, uh, this is the DAG that was created. Um, anything that's not green shows that there's nothing that, that got updated in that last run. Um, just no, no data for it at the time. And so you can see raw text coming in. Um, it, it's running all the processes, getting it to completion. Uh, you can see your full log down here. Ran this about half an hour ago, getting this ready for, for use today. Um, over in settings, you can see uh, this is the name, the product edition. We're using advanced today. So advanced lets you do all the data quality stuff and everything. Pipeline known, triggered, or continuous. We're doing triggered. Uh, source code. So this is what's really neat. Um, each notebook that you use with DLT can only be Python or um, SQL. It, it doesn't uh, handle doing like the a Python notebook with the percent SQL sign in different, different places. But that doesn't mean that you can't combine them together. And so what you see here is you see the ability to add multiple notebooks into a single pipeline. So it's real easy to have maybe a, a SQL pipeline along with a, a Python pipeline. So here, this is Python here that's, that's generating some data. And then this is a, a SQL actual um, a DLT code. So this is, as you see, this is part of the resources folder. It's just a resource there to help generate some data so that you have something to import um, more for demo purposes than anything else. Uh, target schema, so you can specify what, what uh, schema you want it to load into. Um, by default right now, uh, DLT works with um, the Hive Metastore. Uh, when it was released, it didn't, didn't work with Unity Catalog. It, the Unity Catalog DLT solution is currently in private preview. So if you are a Unity Catalog customer, I highly recommend talking to your SA about getting added to that private preview. That said, I would not be surprised if this moves into public preview very soon with the Data and AI Summit. 
um, and everything uh, coming up and that this is a, a very um, necessary feature to create that cohesion between all the products. So uh, if, you, if you need to get started right away, talk about getting into the private preview, it's been going on for a few months. So there, there shouldn't be a lot of changes um, occurring to it at this point. Um, if, if you are going to be using this over the next few weeks, um, maybe next couple of months over the summer, I would definitely attend the Data and AI Summit if, if you can, uh, virtually if you, if you can't come in person um, and, and watch for any news related specifically in the Unity Catalog and, and DLT, and, and then you can get incorporated there. Um, so compute, you can choose your cluster policy. I'm not doing any of that here, just letting it manage it all. Um, advanced add configuration, you can add additional variables that you can reference in your pipelines here. Um, then you can also choose current or preview. So when it does come into public preview, you probably select that. Uh, but anyway, that's those are the settings. And so like this right here, target schema, if you had a dev schema, this would be dev if you had, and then you wanted to move it into testing, uh, your CI CD process when it when it move that over, would just need to update this to testing and you're good to go. Okay. Looks like we have a question. I saw a hand get, get raised. I don't know if we have any other questions. So before I, I step further, I, I'll figure if there's any questions I need to answer. Let me know, Stephanie or Ashley. Maybe not. Let me check the Q&A. What schema is that? This schema right here, the DLT demos. Uh, this is the schema that it gets written out to. So yeah, sorry about that. Thank you, Arul. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is the target schema that the data will be written to in its pipeline. So uh, the, the pipeline itself will drive, will, will show you a point to which uh, file source it should be coming from. Um, and if that changes in dev testing or prod, then I would, I would make it configurable right here by adding you know, dev source files and then, you know, file source like that. Um, and, or maybe I wouldn't call it dev. I would just do it like that, right? Um, source files. And then, uh, then you would have your dev source and then you would update this uh, with your CSTD process for your test source. And then this determines where it's it written to. Uh, so your pipelines, when they get declared, they declare them like it's a, a live schema, but it's really just um, getting the, the schema from here when it actually writes it out. Okay. All right. I'm going to go back to our pipeline here. So as it's running these two things, um, we're going to step into it and see what it looks like. So this is our, our data generator here. Um, I'm not going to walk through it in too much detail. Um, it's generating data and writing it out to a file. If, if you'd like to look at it, uh, modify it, you can. Uh, as I said, this is more for demo purposes, so it's not necessary for understanding DLT. So DLT, as I talked about, it has two different pipeline, uh, two different types of pipelines. You can either build it with SQL or you can build it in Python. Um, so that's what we're going to look at today is we're going to look at SQL. Uh, and then we're also going to look over at Python. And so depending on what you're more familiar with, uh, you can explore that. By default, this is using the SQL, but it'd be real easy to update that. So if we went into settings, we could add source code. Uh, we can pop over here. And we could choose the Python one, delete this one out, and then you'd be running your Python one. I'm not going to do that right now, but that's what you do. Um, correct, Scott. Um, that that would be the case is that if you're trying to target multiple um, multiple schemas, you need a, a separate pipeline for that. 
Um, now you can daisy chain pipelines together. Uh, once again, because they can all run as tasks in a workflow. So you can have one DLT job funnel into another. Um, but yes, that would be correct. They, they need to all go to the same target location. Uh, yes, this will all be shared um, post-session. As I said, um, the, the real key here to be able to get these notebooks would be to do pip install DB demos and then import DB demos, DB demos dot install DLT loans. And that'd be the, the perfect thing. So this is probably what I'll provide uh, for, for communication so that I don't have to package everything up and send it to you. All right, so we're gonna step into the SQL notebook first. Um, it's, it's fairly intuitive. Uh, so this is just taking a look at incoming data. So you can have certain uh, commands like this in the notebook. They won't get run by the, by the pipeline itself, but you can have it here while you're playing around with things. Um, yeah, you know, they quickly move on past that. Uh, but what you have here is you have, for a very first table, you have streaming live table raw text. Um, there's a comment that helps you understand better what that table is. And it's ingesting using cloud files, which this is using um, the DB demos process in the background. Uh, did I say DB demos? This is using auto loader in the background. Sorry, I uh, got my words confused there. But so auto loader, what it's doing is it's going out to this um, folder location, it's looking for JSON files. Uh, and then these are the configuration items or autoloader. If you've ever worked with autoloader, there's a variety of configurations that you can put in. Um, so you can just map out all those configurations here if you'd like. Um, uh, this one that they're using right now is infer column types true. So it's going to infer the column types. You can define the schema here too. Um, so what that does is it imports all that data and lands it into raw text. That's all you need. This is a table right here. This creates an entire pipeline, ingests any new files, um, and lands them in raw text in append only. Um, this one right here, create a referential ref, ref accounting treatment. Um, this does the same thing. Uh, this pulls in files that are in the Delta table that's in this location. So it's, it's ingesting um, a Delta table that already exists and it's uh, naming it ref accounting treatment. So uh, pulling that in, uh, create streaming live table, raw historical loans. Once again, loading CSV files, uh, infer column types true using auto loader. So we're getting all of our, our bronze data here. And then we start doing our silver tables. Um, so we take our raw text from our last process. So you see over here, this is one of the key pieces of syntax differences from like a normal SQL statement. Um, live tells you that we're using DLT and we're using the, uh, the table that was ingested beforehand. So that raw text. So it, this is because the schema is set up in our configuration. Um, and so it, that target schema is there. So this way uh, it, automatically, it automatically determines that that's where it should be pulling it from. Um, and then stream, what this does is this means that we're only gonna be pulling the net new records. So this is how you do incremental processing uh, with DLT. So one of the benefits here is you write code almost like you're doing a truncate and reload, but what, what's really going on is it's processing all your data incrementally. So it uh, saves a lot of time, money, and effort that way um, to be able to do that. And so the stream says basically create a stream of only the change sets and, and move it downstream for me. Uh, and then we're interjoining that to that ref accounting treatment table that we created. So if you see here, it's live, which means we're, we're pulling it um, from this pipeline. But because we don't have the stream, that means we're using the entire data set. Um, so this would be if you have a dimension, for instance, that you need to join against, 
and uh, you don't care about just net new customers or net, net new um, vendors or net new products, you care about the whole table, um, this is how you would set that up so that it, it would use the whole table and not just the net new records that have been ingested. So stream does things incrementally, uh, not stream uses the whole table. So that's how you can control that. Um, and as you see, they're, they're doing their ID, ID joins right here. Um, create streaming live table. So cleaned new text. Uh, so this is an example of setting up a lot of data quality errors right here. So the constraint payment should be this year, checking for next payment date uh, greater than this timeline. Uh, balance should be positive. Um, balance is greater than zero and arrears balance is greater than zero. Uh, so this first one right here, it's just gonna flag it. It's just gonna note it in, in the event log if this fails. Uh, if this one fails, what it's actually going to do is it's gonna drop the row and the record's gonna disappear. Um, and then this last one, cost center must be specified. If the cost center, uh, center code is not, uh, is null, you know, this is checking to make sure that it's not null. If it is null, then this is gonna violate um, fail the update. So it's gonna fail the entire pipeline. Um, and so that way, you know, okay, um, it, there's, there's a bigger problem here. So this is like small, medium, and large in terms of data quality issues. Um, and once again, this is streaming. So it's the net new records from the, the new text file which was created up here in this, this silver layer. So we have new text and then we have cleaned new text, the ones that have data quality issues identified. Uh, this shows that quarantine uh, process right here. So for understanding when data goes bad, what do we do with it? Um, so payment should be this year. If the uh, payment date is below, our balance should be positive. Um, you know, balance it, if that violates on violation drop row. So what this is doing, this sets up the expectations for the good data. This sets up expectations for the bad data. So if the data is bad here, then it, it keeps it. If it violates it, which actually means is it good data, then it drops it. And so what it's creating here is there you have the cleaned new text. And then here you have a table for for just your bad text and it's siphoned off to the side. Um, this line doesn't, it needs to have the on violation drop row, <laughs> if you ask me, because without that, it's still going to let uh, records come through that have the next payment date no greater than thing. I think somebody copied this row down here um, and didn't put that in. And so you really do need this. Uh, this third row isn't necessary. Why? Because if it fails, if this uh, cost center expectation is not met, the whole pipeline fails. So until you fix this, you can't get this pipeline to run anyway. And so there's no point in trying to quarantine it on the side because the, it's never going to get to this point. So you really only need these two checks to identify what your um, records are. If you don't care to see these, this one here, then you can delete this entire row. So it, it really comes down to what you're trying to use this quarantine process for. If you only wanna see the records that were actually dropped, then you would set it up like this. If you care to see all data quality issues that occurred and are downstream, so you know, this one was allowed and it passed through, but this one wasn't, but you still want to be aware that that data quality issue existed, then you'd want to have that there. Um, so, but if you just have this, um, it's, it's not going to do anything for you. So, I hope that made sense. If there are questions, feel free to let me know. Uh, enrich all historical transactions. So um, here, create live table historical transactions. So it, this is where you see some of the logic become a little bit more complex. Um, selecting from uh, 
from the raw historical loans. So uh, uh, one of those the bronze tables that we ingested right there. Um, oh no, no, I, yeah, here it is uh, from raw historical loans. And then interjoin that to the ref accounting treatment. As you see, both of them are using the full tables. There's no just incremental process here. They need to do a full determination of everything inside of it based on this join. Um, I wish I had a good comparison for this, but maybe if you're building out like a customer address table or something and you're importing your customers and importing your addresses, um, uh, maybe, maybe you uh, want to do a, a full scan of both of them. Um, but anyway, on accounting treatment ID equals ref ID. So it's just your basic logic around it. So this is, this is that SQL statement that gives you the view that you want. And then this is uh, how you define that table. And so in the background, it actually creates that table and persists it out for you. Um, so, you know, it's more of the same as we go down here. Uh, this shows you how to do a union and aggregation. So we're doing a sum. It's, it's very similar. So it's selecting from live historical text, live clean new text. Um, to, to, yeah, so it's just more of the same like that. Um, I won't step through it all, but this shows you how to do aggregations and unions. This shows you how to do aggregations again. Um, and, and same thing here. So at this point, we've, we've finished it. This is just comments and stuff in here showing us how we can do this. Um, let's see, make sure we have this dashboard out there. Uh, looks like I need to go find it. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll go pull it up. So the tracking data quality, I haven't, haven't used this in a few months, so someone might've cleaned it up and, and deleted it for me, um, being, being very helpful. But anyway, so the, the tracking data quality dashboard, this is an example of the dashboard that's out there. What we're gonna do here in a little bit is we'll, we'll check the notebook that they include for being able to find those DLT metrics. Um, what I wanna do is I wanna at least step through a little bit of this Python side so you can see what it looks like to do the exact same thing in Python. Um, so the, the Python, it gives you some benefits. Um, because, because it, of the language and things like that, you can actually build functions around creating tables and you can parameterize it and you can load uh, configuration files, uh, metadata driven files. So there's, there's a whole framework around DLT meta um, that, it, that is really uh, nice and helpful for doing metadata driven Pipelines. So if you have a massive warehouse and you want to build it all out using metadata um, and standardized notebooks and things, everything is going to be written in Python. Um, there's a framework for that, and that's something that you can research. It's, it's outside the, the scope of this demo today, but there's, uh, there's solutions that help with that. And so doing things on the Python side helps you scale to those kinds of levels if, if that's what you're looking to do um, through a lot of automation and, and things like that. Um, so here we are, uh, you, you use this first, you got to import DLT. Um, this is all sort of normal stuff here, importing functions. Um, and then you use this special little command right there at DLT, create table comment. This becomes your table comment there. Um, and this is your definition raw text. Uh, we, we saw that earlier. So this is that table name right there. And then all you do is return the stream that that table name is going to look for. And so this streams that data in and lands it there. And so if you've ever worked with Autoloader, this is a very common syntax that you're, you're aware of when working with Autoloader. Spark.readStream, format cloud files. These are your options, JSON and for cloud types, true and then load and you point to the, the file source that you're gonna be loading from. Um, and so if you've ever worked with Autoloader, this is, this is very normal and all you're doing is wrapping it inside um, a function call with this special tag up top to define this as a DLT table. And so in the background, 
it takes that reader the stream and turns it into a DLT table. Um, so similarly, we're going to define the other two just like that. There, it, this one's going to use the a, a delta table that's already out there with the location. This one's going to use um, auto loader once again to pull in that CSV. Exact same situation that we had before. Um, so this one, uh, it's creating a view. So this is, uh, as we said, this is um, you know a temporary table, not a not an actual view that's being built out. Uh, new text. So it's taking uh, the text, reading the stream. So this dlt.readStream, this is how we pull in the stream. So that net new object, um, only the incremental data off of raw text, that table up above, and we're aliasing it as text. And then what we do is we're taking this ref accounting a treatment table, aliasing it as ref. And as you see, it's just a read instead of a read stream. So before we had stream around the live versus just having the live, that's how you demarcate that here. So this is just pulling incremental. This is looking at the full thing. Um, and then we're doing just basic Spark functions in Python. Text join to ref along these columns. It's an inner join. Um, and then these are the columns that we're going to select out of it. And it'll create this, this view um, up above called new text. So here, this uh, building out our silver layer, this is expectations. So this is how you do expectations in Python. It's that at DLT dot expect that has those requirements in it, cleaned new text. And um, we're, we're reading that new text up above the stream. So the net new records, the stream pu pushes through after joining off of that. And we can we can read the stream from there, and so we're still working with incremental data here. Um, hey, Robert, this is the corn. Uh -huh. Real Actually, quick, while you're on, while you're on that section, could you talk about how the expectations are evaluated? The order are they just evaluated in the order in which they're defined, or, or how does that work? Um, that's a good question. Um, you know. I, I feel like I remember looking into that once upon a time because I had that same question. If all three of them got hit, what happens? Um, you know, it's definitely going to fail. Uh, but if the first two got hit, um, how should it be? My 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 personal expectation is that it would run in order. Um, that's probably why they built this out in the order that they have. You know, sort of a low, medium, high. Um, I would need to test it to, to verify, especially if you have two different expectations. Um, if you have two different expectations that should drop the row, I, I think it's going to only fail the first one because I believe I did test that. Um, and so the, the first one would get, would get dropped and the second one wouldn't get flagged for it. Um, but don't quote me on that. You might have to test it. Um, I do remember having that exact same question at one point in time and going through it, but that was probably six to eight months ago when I was working on that. I wish I, I had the firm answer for you. And some of that behavior might have changed too. Because um, me, myself, and I, I, I would like to see, um, I would like to see that uh, both of them get flagged if they are both in violation. Um, and I, I remember thinking that that wasn't what was happening when I was when I was testing it. Um, and so I was thinking about combining them in one, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I, I, I would test it. Thanks. Um, and that could also go down to quarantine. You know, the way this pattern is set up, you don't have to have just a good table and a quarantine table. You can have a good table and then you can have a quarantine for each data quality check. So you could have a, a data quality for null records, a data quality for payment date violations, a, 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 a quarantine table for something else. Um, and then you could union those quarantine tables together, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, so that, that pattern does allow for a lot of different things. Um, and if you wanted to do it in a certain way, you could build views around each of those individual checks and then uh, when you union them, that's when you have your actual quarantine table set up. 
Um, but anyway, that's just a thought. So enrich all historical transactions. This is all the same type of thing. Um, so I'm not gonna go through all this. Uh, you have your expectations, expect or drop. That is how they, they demarcate it differently. So I, I will highlight that. So expect, expect or drop, expect or fail. Um, and so that's how they control what the behavior is if the expectation is, is uh, violated. Um, yeah, uh, everything else is, is exactly the same. Um, if you're familiar with Python and working with um, PySpark, all this is going to look very familiar to you. If you're used to working with SQL and familiar with writing uh, SQL, all of this is going to look familiar to you. So that's that's why you have the option here. Um, if you're just building out notebooks, go with what you prefer. If you're trying to build um, a full scale uh, process that's configurable and, and, and driven by metadata, you probably want to go towards the Python side. Um, before we run out of time here, uh, we do have a little bit of a time check. Um, I want to show the ingestion uh, for the data quality. So there's one last notebook that they include here, and this is log analysis. So what this notebook is doing is it's ingesting um, the, the log file that DLT has in the background, and it shows you how to build out the data quality metrics from it, how to navigate that log to get there. Uh, so this is that path to that, that file. So um, if it's in storage, yeah, this tells you how to find the, the actual file and where it's located. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to ingest from that DL, demos, DLT, loans, and this is the regular expression that it uses to find all the different logs that are out there, ingest them in. Um, and so we see uh, all this, all these storage paths, autoloader, checkpoints, system tables. So in the background, as I said, it's using autoloader, it's creating checkpoints, um, and it has a bunch of processes and stuff in there. So this is accessing that event log, pulling it in. So we see all of our different events that are out there. Um, each run, how does it look? Uh, there's a lot of data in here. Um, and so that's why this notebook is really helpful because it helps you navigate that to find exactly what we're looking for. So if you care about lineage information to be able to recreate a DAG, this is that lineage view that you would need to be able to navigate, to be able to find everything that you're looking for. Um, if you're looking for data quality results, this would be the SQL statement that you can use to be able to find your uh, data quality results. So you see down here, your ID, your data set, um, the comment or the description, or I guess the, the comment and description of the actual data quality issue, the expectation that's being looked for, and then what records passed it, what records failed it. Um, and so you can see all that down here. All right. So um, I'm going to go see if I can find this dashboard. Um, and that would be the last thing that I, I show you guys. So if there's any additional questions, go ahead and throw them out there while I go. Try to find this real quick. One thing that I'm super excited about is we're changing um, the UI over here so that you no longer have to switch personas to get to different things. In fact, this little, little icon right there that would allow me to use the new UI so I don't have to do that. Um, not part of this demo for sure, but that's something I'm excited about. So I no longer have to do that kind of thing. Mine isn't out here, but there's a lot out here. Okay. Yeah, it's not data quality. to load here. Hmm. 
Well, this is what I get for not clicking through absolutely everything. I had one last thing to check. This gives us a good sense of what it could look like. Um, now I'll, I'll go back to that first one because it was very similar. All right, so um, you know this is a semblance of data quality. So here you're able to see all the different locations where new loans are coming through. Uh, you can look at things from a global level. Um, and then down here you can see data quality. So these uh, balances should be positive. I actually have 658 records that weren't positive. Uh, cost center must be specified. Everything passed it. So um, our pipeline didn't fail. We would have seen it fail had it passed, had it failed. Um, and then payment should be this year. So um, it, as you notice, this is probably a little bit of an older uh, process. And so it's checking for the year that's no longer valid. Um, and so that's why we have zero records past this and 10,000 records failed this. So um, that would be a big, issue, we need to go into the code and understand what's going on and look at the data and, um, and, and try to get it fixed for our future pipelines. But this is a good detail of how you might be able to build a dashboard around all the data that you're ingesting and understand the health of your overall system. All right. So uh, we've got a few minutes left. I uh, want to make sure I, I cover everything that, that people are looking for. Um, are there any, any follow-up questions, any topics that you're interested in seeing um, for, for another demo? Um, anything that I said that, that might have piqued your interest that was just out of scope for today? There was a question near the beginning, Robert, about a code example of CDC with DLT. Yeah, I got one. So once again, got to change over. Um, all right, so ignore some of the ugliness that comes with this, but this does do apply changes. So what you'll see here is I'm using cloud files to ingest some data. Uh, I have sort of an oil and gas background. So this demo um, was referring to oil and gas concepts. So we have a well, we have a site, which is really like a pad. Um, I hadn't, well, uh, clearly I, keys, well number. Uh, sequence by change date. So I hadn't run this, I guess. Um, but this is, I, I fixed it, but I haven't run it in a while. Um, so apply changes. This is how you do it. So up above, um, I've created this site bronze DLT table, uh, create streaming live table, well bronze DLT. Um, so it, I'm there it is, my well bronze CDC. So this becomes my uh, CDC table that I want to land into. So uh, I, I have this ingest of CDC data. So this is updates, deletes, everything like that flowing through it. Um, and I want to land that in a table that I do all my merge into. So this is that table that I'm doing the merge. What you notice is you just create the table. You don't actually include any of your logic in it right now. The next step is you do apply changes. So I'm doing my apply changes into live.wellbronzedlt. So that's that table right there from, and I'm streaming my change sets from this table. Um, and the keys are well number. So it's going based on uh, the well number. That's my unique business key for, for each record. So that represents that primary key. And then the sequence by change date. Uh, so it's looking at the each record as it flows in, and this data set has a change date, so a date uh, signifying when the record changed, and it's sequencing by that. And so that's how it knows which record is the most valid or is the most recent. Um, and then I defined it as an SCD type 2 table. And so in the background, it's, it's building this out 
as an SCD type two. Um, if, if you're familiar with slowly changing dimensions, that means it creates a new record instead of updating the old records. Um, and, it, and it manages all that. Um, then yeah, I have some logic that I apply to build out a silver layer. And then I, I do some data quality stuff as well. Um, so that's, this is an example really right here of how to do that merge. So instead of writing all that merge logic, all you got to do is write apply changes into your target table from your source table, define your keys um, and define the, the column that drives what's the most recent record. And then your additional options if you want something like that. If it's an SCD type one, that's the default. So you don't have to specify that. So it becomes really simple. Um, there's some lots of documentation around apply changes into, so that'd be what, what you look for in that. All right, any other questions? This one was a little bit on the fly, so apologize for having a big error right there. Okay, well, if that is it, I appreciate everybody's time this morning. I'll go ahead and sign off and return you guys to your regularly scheduled program with work and everything, but it's good to talk to all of you. Uh, feel free to reach out to your essays or anything with um, questions or um, items that you have. Thanks.